there. Welcome to Collider Movie Talk on this Thirsty Thursday edition. My name is Mark, and on today's show, we have a breaking image of Venom. Or at least the guy who's playing him. Then we have new Black <laughs> Widow news and all the money in the world, most of which went to Mark Wahlberg. <laughs> Joining me today is a fantastic <laughs> panel, including some old favorites and some newcomers making her debut on Collider Hello. Movie Talk from Black Girl Nerds and, of course, the Schmoes No Show. Miss Joelle Monique is Yay! here, everybody. Hey, everybody. Yay. Super excited to be here. I am so excited to have you. I'm glad that we all brought our various beverages. John yeah. Roke is here from <laughs> Noah's Bagels. That's right. I got my orange juice this time. <laughs> you can't fool me with the rice tea if I can see the orange juice. I, get, I know what I'm getting this time. You know, for a character <laughs> named The Outlaw, I thought you might be more of a Western Bagel kind of guy, but oh, now you go Noah's. Well, it's too far out, Western Bagel. There's literally one right around the corner. We'll talk about it after the show. <laughs> Wendy Lee is also here. Uh, Roka, I can totally show you where the Western Bagels is. It's literally around the corner, and it's better than Noah's. What? Oh, better Shots than Noah's. I said it. It's faster service, okay? Okay, look, there's a lot of debate going on this show already, but I have something that's going to unite us, and it's not even on the rundown right now. Oh, no, this is breaking news. I want everybody to sit down. I want you to buckle your safety belts, put up your trade tables, because we are in for a crash landing of excitement with the first image from Venom. Roll it, everybody! Woo! Yay. Look at that! Wow. Look at that! Where is Venom? <laughs> well, that's Tom Hardy looking at what appears to be the Grail notebook from Indiana Jones in the Last <laughs> Crusade, and he's got some sort of cool uh, bad boy wrist bracelet that you can only wear if you have a certain size forearms, which I do not. I don't try to pull them off. Uh, Joel, do we make anything out of this Venom? And now, look, I'll be honest with you. If this was a Star Wars pick, I'd be like, look, this is going to be the best movie of all time. I mean, Tom Hardy's going to be the Star Wars movie. It's, yes, it's it, going to be the best. Is this going to be the best Venom movie we've ever seen? I mean, by default, maybe? Best live action Venom-centric sure. film ever? Sure. Uh, I, I don't understand uh, this tactic. They're like, yeah, he's sexy, I guess, is the point. It does seem like a, a, a step backwards because there was that, you know, not official release of what the movie poster promotional material might look yeah. like a couple weeks ago. Then they released this. And look, Tom Hardy, it, it, he looks focused on something. He looks like he's interacting with a human being. Yeah. But uh, Wendy, I just don't know if we're supposed to glean something from this that I'm not seeing. I mean, I love Tom Hardy, but I am zero impressed by this photo. I mean, if your breaking title is first look at Venom, but you don't show us Venom in the symbiosis because you're trying to hold it a secret. Guys, it's not a secret. There's comic books. Guess what? It's secrets <laughs> out. Yeah. Show us the suit. So the one thing I kind of took away from this, if I had to take anything away from the fact that they actually show Tom Hardy's face because they like covering him with masks, <laughs> is, is the bracelet you talked about. And it's, so is that, theoretically, hypothetically, theorizing here, is that just a cool accessory that he wants to wear? Or is that how they're going to do the symbiote suit? Mm. Oh. Are there notes about the Probably symbiote suit incorrect. in that in notebook? The no yeah, exactly. Yeah. So again, all theory. <laughs> uh, Roka, yep. what I liked about what, how they promoted it <laughs> is that they didn't give away Pennywise's look fully, but you yep. got to see a little, you got to see him hiding behind a balloon and there was something there. So is that yeah. the tactic they're going to utilize with Venom? I don't know. It's certainly possible. I think if you look at that picture, if you look at him staring at the book, uh, you can read it if you zoom in on there. It says Peter Parker is Spider-Man. So he's, <laughs> he's already one step yeah, he's ahead. It out. It's pretty amazing. But we don't see the blonde hair. We don't see the crew cut. So we, we see he's just Tom Hardy. So And he's, and the workman's shirt kind of conveys uh, a little bit of like he's just a, he's like a worker bee. He's a blue-collar guy. So we're getting that vibe from the picture. At least that's what I get. But yes, for a first look of Venom, this is somewhat a little lame. You know, he looks like he's in the airport. He's like, oh, am I being delayed? Where, where can I can I get that uh, changeover in Charlotte? You know, it just seems like there's nothing really that you can get from this that's uh, super exciting for Venom. You know, we get rid of that Marty McFly life preserver you got, and you are wearing <laughs> a Tom Hardy shirt. So maybe Roka is, in fact, developing a symbiote. So we're going to move on to our first <laughs> official story that also has a character wearing a cool, tight black uniform, and that would be Black Widow. Breaking news yesterday, Scarlett Joe. Hanson obviously plays Black Widow, and now we have confirmation that a film has reached the development stages. Variety is reporting that a script is being penned by writer Jack Schaefer. Sources for the trade say the movie is still very early in development, as the film has no green light yet, but naming a writer is the closest the studio has come to moving forward on the standalone pick. The report also states that Marvel Studios 
Studios head Kevin Feige met with several potential candidates to write the film before choosing Schaefer. Obviously, there is no release date at this time. And I should point out, too, that Schaefer is a uh, young lady who wrote a script on the blacklist that got a lot of notoriety. It's about an alien invasion that happens during a bridal shower. Anne Hathaway mm -hmm. loved it, fell in love with it. She asked Schaefer to work on something else as well. So she's making the rounds around Hollywood. And as far as the right choice for Black Widow, that remains to be seen. Wendy, if you have a Black Widow standalone movie, is it the right time to release after Infinity War? And when should this movie take place, before or after the events of Infinity War? Uh, I think... I, well, I personally would love to see a Black Widow movie, and if they choose to to release it after Infinity War, I am going to still buy a ticket to see it. As far as the time setting goes, I want to see, and we saw a little bit of this in Age of Ultron where she was in that school. I want mm. to see that story. So in a sense, it'd be like a period piece, like Joelle had talked about it earlier. It'd be like very, very much like a, a Wonder Woman or origin type, and I completely agree with, with that point. And I am just so interested in to seeing where she came from because when we first saw her in was I think Iron Man 2, I was not impressed with her. I didn't like her hair. I didn't like who she was. <laughs> you didn't like the giant chunky ringlets? No. That wasn't doing it for you? Yeah, it's not cute. Terrible. Uh, but they improved a lot and now it's a character I look forward to seeing in all these movies. The chunkier the ringlets, the better for me, Roko. <laughs> yeah. When you hear a Black Widow movie is on the table, does it surprise you that it's going to be coming out after Infinity War? Does that give us any indication of what the character's fate in the Infinity War 2 movie? is going to be. Yeah, this is an interesting point you bring up, Mark. Uh, is she going to survive everything? We haven't seen, like you see the, the the slow motion of them all, you know, the vision that Iron Man had. Is this going to happen? Is she going to be one of those people that does die? But the timing of this all is really, really strange. With Red Sparrow, that trailer coming out, mm. and then Marvel coming Oh yeah, we've got a, uh, you know, people have been clamoring for a Black Widow movie for such a long time. And now with Wonder Woman, now with Captain Marvel, now you're going to show up with a Black Widow movie? It seems a bit of a disservice to what Scarlett Johansson has been building through the movies. Now, will it all work out? Possibly because people have enjoyed her in the movies. Like you said, Wendy, she's gotten better in each film. People, She's gotten more fleshed out. I mean, not her as an actress, but I mean, her character's yeah. gotten more fleshed out. We've gotten more background. So that excites me. The thing is, what's the Black Widow plot of the movie going to be? Mm -hmm. And I wonder if they're going to play around with Widowmaker, which is what mm -hmm. she did with Hawkeye, and we could bring in Mockingbird. That's a new character. Play around with that. So I would love to see that, where we get her like paired up with somebody and let it work through, because she does well with Captain America. She does well when she does stuff with Hawkeye. It, it makes it humanizes her, or else she's like an assassin. And we're, we already saw that we're going to see that with Red Sparrow. And you you're going to be, it's going to be really hard to avoid comparisons mm -hmm. if you don't give her something different to do than what you see in Red Sparrow already. Yeah, so you bring up Red Sparrow, you have movies like Atomic Blonde that have come yeah. out recently. You have a lot of kick-ass females on their own, and uh, Joel, you mentioned Wonder Woman too, so if you have Wonder Woman come out, and then you have a Black Widow movie come out, is this simply a matter of Marvel not being able to shoehorn in a Black Widow movie before this point? Or do you think that they're finally realizing that this might be the right film to do after Infinity War is over? I think with the hype around Captain Marvel, they're certainly getting excited and seeing you know the positive sales effects from Wonder Woman. I almost wonder though it feels like too late on Black Widow yeah. like I don't I don't want to I feel bad for Scarlett Johansson because she's obviously put a lot of time and dedication into this character she's one of the like main crew who should have had a movie much earlier but at this point as a Marvel fan like Captain Marvel's coming out uh you just got the um X-Men characters back like I'm really like can we move on to Storm can Storm get a dope solo movie now <laughs> um if they I'm hoping that they do the storyline that's in the current comic book series where Widow kind of breaks off from everything and decides mm. to be her own person. Like, I'm not taking orders from anybody. I'm no longer the spy I was when I was 16. Um, but now I'm solo and I'm, I'm figuring out what kind of missions I want to lead and who I am as an individual. I think that would be interesting. I'm always asking for superhero movies to go a little smaller. And I'd like to see a more interpersonal story with her. And that's a trade-off you have because this, this character is someone that we know from this giant universe, the MCU, and we're going to see her interact with hundreds of other superheroes in Infinity War. And then you have a standalone movie where we're like, okay, well, if it takes place before she got hooked up with the Avengers, it's just going to Black Widow, and, and as excited we are to see that, then we know we're not going to get any other cameras from other Marvel characters. If it takes place after Infinity War, then we know there's a chance that somebody else pops in there. She has a relationship with somebody where she clearly worked well with Captain America, which uh, Winter Soldier featured her a lot. It wasn't her headlining the movie, but she was in that flick a lot. I personally am very excited to just see a spy story with Black Widow, but Roca mm -hmm. is the appetite that the fans have for seeing all these heroes together. We're so spoiled and inundated mm -hmm. with multiple heroes 
heroes in one movie, is that going to sour the taste in people's mouths if it's just Black Widow? No, I don't think so. And I think Joelle brings up a great point. Letting her split off, do her own thing, not be uh, beholden to anybody, mm -hmm. that certainly would be a fun thing to see Scarlet sink her teeth into. And I'd like to know, and because I, I think the public will be excited because they've been clamoring for so long. I think we'll get past the fact that it's be, it's too late or it mm -hmm. feels like it's a bit too late. I think we'll get past it from that. Once we see the first trailer, it's fantastic. I think we'll all get excited for it. My concern is this. Where are, uh, where, by the, how much input is Scarlett going to have in this? Is mm -hmm. she in the room? Mm -hmm. Is she there with Kevin Feige listening to the script? Is this going to work for her? Because I have to believe that a little piece of it not happening is also Scarlett not rattling the cage a little bit. Maybe she hasn't been necessarily pushing to have a, Scar Scarlet a Black Widow had... movie, but I wonder. I, I just wonder about it. Yeah, yeah no, I don't mean to interrupt, but Scar Scarlett has had two major films come out where she was the lead in their kind of action, and they both didn't do so hot yeah. in yeah, the box Lucy office. and Ghost in right. the Shell. So yeah. I wonder if, if that was Marvel's reason to be like, oh, you mm -hmm. know, you went out there twice. To be fair, though, I don't think that those teams had the creative team that Marvel has, right. and 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 such the developed character. I and like, I feel bad for Scarlett. I feel like a Black Widow movie should have come out before either of those mm -hmm. and hyped us for yeah. those movies. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, you also have uh, Chris Hemsworth who opens a Thor movie because it's Thor. People go see it when he's in in the heart of the sea or any or Black Hat <laughs> or any of these other movies that it's just not the same kind of pop. So I think Scarlett Johansson is arguably the biggest star that you have right now in the MCU. You could say maybe it's Robert Downey Jr. Maybe it's Chris Evans and Mark Ruffalo. I think Scarlett Johansson's right up there, Wendy. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the thing is that we see her in almost all these ensemble movies because she kind of brings them together. Yep. And she also, people forget, she opens that uh, uh, with that kick-ass chair fight scene. Yeah. In, it's exactly, in Avenger. Oh, and that oh, was exactly what I wanted from, from Black Widow. And that right there, from me not liking her at all to completely in love with her, in just in that scene, I was like, oh, I'm sold. And that's why I'm so looking forward to a Black Widow standalone. It may not be necessary. It may be a little too late. But I think now with the president said that we have had Wonder Woman and it's so successful, I would love, and with Captain Marvel coming out, I, I would love to add another standalone co uh, female comic superhero yeah. to the list. I think we use the term tragedy uh, talking about movies way too often, but it is a little disappointing to know that the the, the split that happened between Kevin Feige and Perlmutter, it means Means that you have the movies and the Netflix Marvel series are just so totally different because if they all won a big happy family, I think it would have been interesting to see a Black Widow series on Netflix because oh, if you have yeah. a spy story, be it play out almost like the Americans, which is something yeah. that I am really I'm late to the game and I'm really getting into. But if you have the big screen treatment for Black Widow, I'm all for it. And maybe one day Tessa Thompson's vision can come true of Valkyrie <laughs> teaming up with maybe a, a, an older Captain Marvel coming from the 90s and then Black Widow in the modern era, and we can just have a kick-ass version with a lot of female superheroes in the MCU. We'll see how it all plays out. In the meantime, we're going to move on to a movie that is actually already out in theaters and took home a couple Golden Globe nominations that would be all the money in the world and it's not all good mm -hmm. news all the money in the world had a mad scramble to do reshoots that would remove kevin spacey slash voldemort from the movie in order to <laughs> replace him with christopher Plummer. director ridley scott managed to pull it off incredibly telling usa today that the actors returned for free in order to complete the reshoots uh, it turns out that wasn't exactly the case according to usa today mark Wahlberg was paid 1.5 million for his participation in the reshoots while co-star michelle Williams only got an $80 per diem that added up to around $1,000. Dollars, Roca. Yeah. There is a lot of negative publicity surrounding yeah. around this story, and rightfully so, because when you just look at it on the surface, a male co-star getting a million and a half, and Michelle Williams, the female lead of the movie, getting an eighty-dollar per diem. What are we to make of this? Yeah, this is an uncomfortable story all around, and it, especially from I'm represented by William Morris for voiceover stuff, so like I try not to be biased here, but. I have to think somebody dropped the ball over there in 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 the negotiations of this situation because Wahlberg making one and a half million now did Wahlberg's people go to them and say like you know uh, there's other movies you're pushing the schedule back in order to get me you're gonna have to pay this much why was he the only one that was negotiating that on the side and is you know we see this in sports all the time you know players some players sacrifice for the team some players are like I'm getting paid no matter what because you could drop me at any moment I get an injury and you'll fire me off the team never hire me I gotta get take care of myself and there have been reports on of uh, people have been reporting on Twitter like who have had interactions with with Wahlberg that uh, some of the things, first things he asks is, are you getting paid, bro? Are you getting paid? Are they paying you? So there are just some people with a mindset that walk into a situation, they're like, I'm going to get mine no matter what. 
What anyone else does, sorry, what everyone else does on their own is their own business, but my business is to get me some money. So did he sacrifice for the film? Clearly not. Was he like the least stand out of the film? Absolutely. So there's a lot of aspects to this story that are uncomfortable. And then the pay gap situation has been really prevalent over the last couple of years. More and more actresses are coming out and talking about it. Obviously, Jessica Chastain, Patricia Arquette talked about it. So many actresses have talked about it. Um, so it, it would surprise me if the studio would make this kind of mistake in 2018 without there being something else, some other reason behind it. Because neither Wahlberg or Williams have come out and said anything. And Ridley Scott said that they all did it. Uh, uh, you know, they all sacrificed their their uh, money to come back and do the reshoots, mm -hmm. but we know now that that isn't 100% true. Well, I mean, Mark Wahlberg is one of the busiest guys in Hollywood, but yeah. I can't imagine that his schedule is that much more packed than Michelle Williams, who is also uh, a very talented, yep. popular working actress who is a threat to win an Oscar every time she's in front of the camera. Mm -hmm. So, Joel, I don't necessarily make this Mark Wahlberg versus Michelle Williams. No. It seems to me like this is more of an agency issue, because mm -hmm. they're both represented by teams at William Morris, and one of the teams decided to negotiate something huge for Mark Wahlberg and did the other team drop the ball or is there something that we're just not seeing? I mean, I would love to hear Michelle Williams thoughts on this, obviously, <sighs> uh, to try to see if maybe, maybe, because maybe she's just like, you know what, I, I didn't need the money. I'm fine. And I understood that we were doing this because we were taking a potential predator out of the film. Yeah. You know, like the, the reason they're reshooting was to avoid like scandal in the first place. And maybe that was her <laughs> like maybe that was her thing was like, you know, I don't need it. Like, I'll come back. Of course, I want to reshoot. This is the right direction we should be moving in. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, it just seems to open up a conversation about like we always talk about the studios. Like, are you hiring diverse? Are you bringing in like both men and women? Like, are you paying? But this is kind of out of the studio's hand. I mean, if you negotiate for a lower rate, like we don't we have an obligation to the company to take that lower rate. Um and so now I'm kind of want to shift focus and look at agencies. Like, to what degree do they owe their clients, you know, the same amount? Like, should they be trying to seek equal pay for their clients in the same films? Especially because Michelle Williams has been nominated, like you said, mm. like almost every time she's gone. Like, mm -hmm. didn't she not win for My Week with Marilyn? Uh, she was nominated for. She might have won for it. I have to look that I up. But she also, this, she was the she was the person. She was the main reason why they wanted to do the research for all the money in the world mm -hmm. in the first place because she had the potential to be nominated for an Oscar. Mm -hmm. Everybody said, "Oh, she gives an Oscar worthy performance." Mm -hmm. So let's make sure we don't screw up. Uh, Michelle Williams's chance at getting nominated, Wendy. That seems like an unfair trade-off. Where it's like, hey, uh, Wahlberg's not that good in the movie, so we'll pay him a million and a half. You're yeah. really good. You can win a statue, so we'll give you eighty dollars a day. Yeah, I, I. This is such like you said. Like it's so uncomfortable when I read it, and I was just like, okay. So it's what it sounds like. It's everybody agreed that they were gonna like give up their time and holiday, and because it was an unfortunate thing that they had to, you know, take mm -hmm. out Kevin Spacey and put in Christopher Plummer, and like everybody agreed. Okay, we're gonna just come back and do these. Research because we're passionate about the project and we're going to take the per diem as you should and then somebody else went and it's like okay but we're going to negotiate 1.5 because he had a bigger part in the movie or he had more leverage is what i'm reading on new york times and yeah. i i am not i am not okay with that i mean when you're on a you're on a team a production team and then you agree and you say yes i understand the situation we are we are passionate about the project so we're going to come back and we're gonna shoot, but now on the side you do this, and it just, and then now no one's talking about it. I really want to hear from either their teams or from themselves, like to see, kind of give us a look at what happened, because especially now with you know like hashtag Times Up is trending and everything, it's, it's this should not be coming to light at all, and and it's very unbalanced. Unless Michelle Williams specifically said, I do not want money, and regardless of how much other people may be getting paid, and if that's the case, and obviously the situation, it's it's what she's offered. Well, that's what she she did say. Like I mm -hmm. said to them that I would come back no matter what, whatever it takes, I will come back. I'll give you. But that doesn't mean the studio didn't shouldn't have made it right. Shouldn't have done it right mm -hmm. by her. Shouldn't have known that they had negotiated. Because the studio knows what they were negotiating, what the contracts are. Obviously, we could blame the agencies, but the agents are sharks. They're there to get their 10%. Yep. That's what they're driven to do. They do go by the mandates of the actor, though, right? The actor will tell them, go get my money. You know, that's that's kind of how it works. So I, I, think, I think you have a fair point, Joel, to say we should look at the agencies. The problem is... What are we going to do with that? Are we going to change them? Are we going to tell them they can only get 10% when this happens? But in reshoots, you only get this much, you only get that much. Like it becomes, there's a lot of X factors involved, especially as reshoots become so much more common nowadays than ever before. And so we'll see how this plays out. But it's the studio thing that I, I kind of look at the studio more than anything else because the studio knows what's being negotiated and they know they have the numbers in front of them. The accountant has the numbers in front of him or her and she's looking at them going, okay, 
some we're paying this much or more. But why wasn't this brought up before? Yeah, this just seemed, it seemed like it was a team effort on everybody. I think that's why it's confusing because you can have I'm all for equal pay in, in the workplace, but Hollywood is not a typical job where if you have somebody like uh, Mark Wahlberg who has made uh, a lot of blockbuster movies and you're you're paired with an actress Michelle Williams, that seems like it should be on the same playing field. However, if you're a huge star and you're acting opposite somebody who's a newcomer, that huge star is the reason why people go see the movie. So I don't have a problem with that person making more money yeah. because they're the one on the poster is going to be selling tickets in the same way they wouldn't have a problem with if Scarlett Johansson and Scoot McNary are in a movie together. Scarlett Johansson should make more money than Scoot McNary because not a lot of people are paying just to see Scoot McNary. Everybody's paying to see Scarlett Johansson. The other interesting wrinkle to this story, then we'll move on, is that I think that, and, and the people have surmised this on Twitter, there's a writer, Jeremy Smith, who first brought this up to my knowledge, said that $80 a day is per day. That's a very weird number because yeah. that is so far below what a lead in a movie, according to SAG Law, makes on a movie, whether it's a reshoot or otherwise. So, Roca, because yeah. you are in SAG, I'm SAG eligible. I haven't signed the paperwork <laughs> yet. I don't need the insurance. You. Although this cough, I might have to put some ink to paper. <laughs> you scab. <laughs> what <laughs> is... How could that possibly get around their rules, even if it's just a reshoot for the good of humanity? Well, like I said, these contracts are really layered, and it all depends on what she signed initially. And if there was if there was a, a wording in the contract, the initial mm -hmm. contract, about reshoots, what would be the situation? You know, what, what she'd worked out, that kind of thing. Your standard, like I do a voiceover, one day voiceover, I get nine hundred dollars SAG. But most SAGs like one fifty, three hundred fifty, four hundred. It depends on what you negotiate. If you're doing a Latino film, it's half. So it just all depends on what the situation is for a feature film and the length and the extension and what you've negotiated as well with your with your studio. If you have a contract to do multiple films as well, so there's a lot involved here. But eighty dollars seems yeah, like it that's seems really low. that's only thirty dollars above what a non-union extra makes for an entire day with a bag lunch so to me this is a surprising thing for her to agree to 80 dollars per diem yeah I, I i don't know what the craft services line looked like but i hope michelle <laughs> williams got first pick of everything because it does not seem fair right now i do believe there's more to this story than what has been reported so far so we'll wait and see how that all plays out in the meantime we have some other movies that are a little less controversial that are coming into theaters this weekend we already talked about paddington bear earlier in the week i saw it yesterday it's a pretty good movie we also have this week look out everybody we have two action flicks proud mary is first yes. up taraji p henson plays mary a hit woman working for an organized crime family in Boston whose life is completely turned around when she meets a young boy whose path she crosses when a professional hit goes bad. Ooh. I hate when that happens. We also <laughs> have the commuter insurance salesman Michael is on his daily commute home when he is contacted by a mysterious stranger forced to uncover the identity of a hidden pastor on the train before the last stop. Michael works against the clock to solve the puzzle that carries life and death stakes for everyone on the train. So which movie are we seeing in theaters this weekend? I will tell you what I'm seeing. Proud Mary. Why? Because I saw The Commuter. <laughs> and I don't want to ride that train again. <laughs> Wendy, I'm putting you in a movie theater. You seeing Proud Mary? You seeing The Commuter? Oh, which one you well, want? Well, Mark, I was with you uh, when we saw The Commuter, <laughs> and I will happily give my money to Proud Mary. <laughs> Proud Mary is actually something I'm, I'm pretty excited to see because you see this with with with, with uh, a lot of male stars where it's like, oh, you know, I've had a I've had a distinguished career. People know who I am. Let me do an action movie. Let me be a Denzel. Or Liam Neeson mm -hmm. here and kick some ass. Taraji P. Henson seems like she can pull that off pretty well. I mean, if we see what she can do on Empire as Cookie, yeah. she can handle anything that comes at her. She is she is a force to be reckoned with. She is fierce, and uh, I don't believe I've seen her in any any in a, in a role like this one, this ac action pack type of role. So I'm mm -hmm. very very excited to see what see what she can do. Uh, I mean, is that is this out this weekend? It is yep. out this weekend. Unfortunately, we did not get a press screening available for Proud Mary. So I'm going to try to check it out this weekend. Joelle, are you on the Proud Mary train or are you riding the commuter one? I mean, Mark, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be proud, Mary. Yay! Let's be real about it. Uh, I don't know if you guys have been following a lot of the controversy online. A lot of people yes. feeling like this wasn't promoted well or at all, really. Now, living in LA, I always feel like uh, it's much different. I'm never sure like what people are receiving outside of the bubble. Um, well, we all really live in our individual bubbles, and like, and true. I heard that too, and, and I heard it with Wonder Woman as well. And like, just because I do what I do every day, we're kind of inundated with. I oh, we know these movies are coming out. I've seen a trailer on TV out. for this, though. I've seen a couple of billboards here mm -hmm. and there. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw one last night. It was on the Weather Channel. Oh. <laughs> what? Like, yeah, uh, ABC was like presented by Proud Mary. I'm like, okay. Um, but I haven't really seen a lot for it. Um, there's a lot of fear that because there wasn't a screening in advance um, that maybe the movie's not that great. Um, but then other people saying that, you know, this is pretty atypical of Sony. Like, they, they spend a lot of money, they make these movies, and then they're just like, eh, it'll find an audience. Um, so <laughs> I don't... 
I will be going with a group of friends. We're going to try to, um, I know Black Girl Nerds has been doing a lot to try to promote the film uh, ourselves, essentially. Just be like, no, please go watch it. Uh, my friend Joy just interviewed Taraji. She had some interesting thoughts about how it was not being um, advertised specifically internationally, like at all wow. internationally. So it'll be interesting to see. I hope people go out and see it. It looks interesting. Uh, and again, it's Taraji. Like, you know she's going to put on a performance. It's going to be fun mm -hmm. at the very least. Uh, count me on going to see it. I think I'm more just concerned about your day today that you're watching the Weather Channel. That <laughs> much. John Broca. Uh, Liam Neeson versus Taraji P. Henson. Who's winning at the box office? Listen, they call it Movie Pass for a reason. That means <laughs> I can go see both this weekend. I've already got plans to see Commuter tomorrow because it's Liam Neeson. I can't resist the Neesons. And I'm definitely going to to go see uh, Proud Mary because I love Taraji P. Henson and I want to support the idea of female assassins getting movies yes. like Atomic. I went to see Atomic Blonde. I know it didn't get <laughs> not great. real females. No, no, not real. Well, <laughs> you, know, you, gotta, you gotta live. You gotta. Live. I want more actual you know? people who kill for a living to get movies. <laughs> I'm just saying. I went to see Atomic Blonde and people didn't give it great reviews and I enjoyed the hell out of that. It was so, so much fun. Right, and so I, and I agree. This could be a John Wick situation. Remember, John? They tried to bury John Wick. Weinstein tried to bury John Wick and it blew the doors off anyway. So if this comes out and it's great then I want people to go over and over again to see this because if you if you're going to talk the talk you got to walk the walk mm. if you're going to talk diversity you got to go out and support these films you got to be there and give them their money give them your money and do what you can and so that that's the thing you've got to support it in some way I just wanted to circle back to Joelle's thing real quick about not not seeing enough marketing. If I didn't work where I worked mm. and hung out with the group of people that I hung out with or read these show notes, I would have no idea what Proud Mary is about or that it was even coming out. And then secondly, we were I was looking at some of the images and we, we have her in a blonde wig. Is yeah. that like a must have in all spy, yes. all spy movies, <laughs> Atomic Blonde? Red Sparrow. Yeah, true, Red Sparrow. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure Scarlett Johansson has. Well, she's gonna have blonde hair mm -hmm. now, and now, and now, Proud Mary. So it's just blonde think assassins. That's, the blonde blonde assassins is the thing. <laughs> Make it a trend. The big wheels keep on turning. Proud Mary in theaters this weekend. <laughs> We're gonna move on to agree or disagree, to buy or sell. The most confusing segment of this show. I'll basically just read it, and then I'll give everybody some sort of setup. The first one is gonna be a lot of fun because it's a Star Wars story that's gonna warm your heart. John Williams, the greatest living composer, in my humble opinion with 40 years of movies and two different studios making them the one constant in the star wars universe has been john williams he surrounds us he penetrates us he binds the galaxy together Hello. the okay. maestro has scored eight <laughs> out of the 10 star wars movies that were released in theaters and now it is official he'll return to finish out the skywalker saga variety reports via film music reported that he is set to score jj abrams's star wars episode nine john williams said that he would very much like to complete the saga that he started way back in 19. 77. Roca, agree yeah. or disagree that John Williams is the right choice to do a Star Wars movie? Uh, <laughs> no! It's a terrible choice! No, no, no. I, I think it's a great choice for him to finish this out. I know people have come, been coming at me on Twitter because I didn't like the fact that he's scoring Han Solo's theme for the Solo Star Wars story. That's, that's a separate thing. This is trilogy. When it's trilogy, John Williams. That's who you want. I think it'd be perfect for him. To, he's 85 years old now. I want him to go ahead and finish it. And he gave a great quote. He said, I feel very lucky and the work that I do doesn't doesn't depend on much. If your vision's still good in your hands, I have no arthritis in my hands, and I play the piano very easily, I don't think there's any reason to deprive oneself of the fun of working. Music is so rewarding. So that's, that's what you want to hear, and so he's excited to work on it. If he's excited to work on it, I know he's getting on an age, he's, having some, he's had some health problems, then I'm for it a, a thousand percent, and I know, because I love the Last Jedi score, mm -hmm. I know he's gonna even go more blank to the wall <laughs> to uh, to to create a great episode nine score. I just I'm looking. It's going to be. I think it's going to be more powerful, more incredible, and just uh, more moving than we've seen before from him. Yeah, John Williams is doing the theme for the Han Solo movie, but John Powell is actually uh, right. composing the rest of the music for that. Joel, John <laughs> Williams doing episode nine. We can only really judge people based on their most recent work. It's a what have you done for me lately? So as much as we all love the original Star Wars theme and Superman and Indiana Jones and Jaws and all that stuff, has John Williams's recent work in your mind, given him enough credibility to finish out the... I can't even believe... I can't even get the question out of the <laughs> <way>. <laughs> I'm just trying to start some sort of debate here. I feel working. like it's really hard to debate. I mean, I could if I just wanted to play devil's egg. Like, give someone else a chance, you old man. But it would be rude and ageist. You know, like... <laughs> It's a really dick move. I don't want to see that. Um, and I think that, I think to Roka's point of like he should finish out the trilogy. Like yeah. we have these 
I killed Rogue. Get off that podium, old man. <laughs> Get off that podium. <laughs> no, I think it's going to be great. I think it's going to round it out. I think it's going to be beautiful as always and uplifting and you'll feel things. I'm interested to see if he's going to stay in L.A. because they had the oh, L.A. Yeah. Symphony Orchestra mm-hmm. do the uh, last film uh, and the Master Choir here as opposed to the one in London. Right. Uh, so I don't. that was just really interesting. I was like, oh, yeah, L.A., win. I don't know why. I just I feel like we're better than London. So. I got to see him conduct the hell out of the Orlando <laughs> Symphony Orchestra when it was summer <laughs> celebration. I don't care. He be conducting the four of us playing kazoos, and he's going to come up with a good score. True. Wendy, uh, you can be the one contrarian on the table if you want to be, or oh you God. can just join in the fun. I don't like. No, are you kidding me? <laughs> uh, when I when I when we met, went to the Star Wars premiere and I met him nervously, like tried to shake his hand and completely fumbled my words, and I was just like, "I really like your work." And he's like, "What's that?" And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm an "Idiot of myself right now." No, I absolutely love everything he's he's done. I actually am okay with him uh, composing the the theme for Han Solo, which is okay. if you want to play a little devil's advocate there, Roca. Oh. Um, you know, I'll, I'll take as much John Williams uh, as as uh, he has time to give us. And Star Wars is just, when you think Star Wars, you think, when it comes to score, no other than John Williams. And I know when, and this is an anthology story, but when he didn't compose Rogue One, I feel like the review was kind of mixed on whether or not like Michael Giacchino did a good job or it, could, it should have been John Williams or how John Williams' themes didn't, wasn't really incorporated well. Mm. So, but I am, I am happy for him to continue Composing as much as possible. For yeah, the really only unpopular segment I have with John Williams is that I'm I'm just not a huge fan of the the prequel scores other than Duel of the Fates. It did, nothing really moves me. I know a lot of people love the Anakin Padme mm-hmm. theme. Just that it didn't really get into me. But then the Force Awakens really brought back a lot of the nostalgic John Williams feelings that I have, yeah. as well as Star Wars. And then I continue with the Last Jedi. So I'm looking forward to him scoring Episode Nine, whatever that movie is going to be titled. And we are going to move on to a DC story that is sure to get a little bit more debate than we just. <laughs> Had with the John Williams story. It was just a year ago when we learned that Batman Begins and Man of Steel screenwriter David Goyer was hired on to write a script for DC and Warner Brothers to do the Green Lantern Corps film. That's alongside writer Justin Rhodes, but not much else has been revealed since. Now Goyer is offering an update at the Television Critics Association Winter Press Store to promote his new series, Krypton. IGN asked Goyer about the status of the new Green Lantern film, in which he responded, I don't know. Who knows, especially with what's currently going on with the DC Universe. There's obviously a whole recalibration happening with that right now. Now, the interesting thing about this and the reason why it's on movie talk is that, yeah, we want to talk about whether a Green Lantern Corps movie should happen sooner rather than later. But also, Joel, this recalibration that Goyer hinted at, what does that mean? What are we to glean from this quote that is filled with question marks? I mean, honestly, it just feels like hope to me. But then it's DC and I'm like, I just... We are always getting our emotions toyed with, I feel like. If you are, especially I feel like if you're a DC fan of like 90s comic but I've, I've come to realize and accept that like there are two halves of a DC fan pool. And some people like caught on with uh, Christopher Nolan's movies and that's where their DC heart is. And like everything from there it kind of falls under the same umbrella and, and we're looking at similar themes and, and tones. And so I get that they're just like, whatever DC brings, like that's what I came for initially. But for me, like I really, I love the characters, uh, stories that were shared in the comic books, early animation stuff from the 90s and things. Um, I would love it if they were like, you know, we're just going to start over. Like, we, we'll, we'll keep Wonder Woman. We know that that works. She's going to be our core. And, and maybe we, like, I mean, in the craziest world, we jump forward, like, a few years. Because Green Lantern Corps can be placed anywhere in time. Mm-hmm. And that's what makes it really great. Wonder Woman's a god. She doesn't have to die. She doesn't age. Is that what needs to happen in order to have more announcements? Because I think the thing that upsets a lot of fans is that they're announcing all these movies that are in production. Oh, we have this director attached to this project, but we don't really know where it's going to land. And then directors leave projects a lot recently in the DCU. So do you think that, th- that we need to have that recalibration and that resetting before we can announce movies like Green Lantern Corps? I, I, I do wish that they as a company would just take a break and be like, we're figuring things out and we will come back with a plan <laughs> shortly. I think, I mean, what else can you do? Like, it's so confusing trying to keep up with where we're at. You know, some people are like liking, you know, a story here or there or a character here and there. Um, with Justice League, what I'm hearing from a lot of critics who saw earlier cuts is that you know, they cut out a lot of the origin stories that were in there so that they were, would be able to do it in other films, which seems weird. And now those films are coming out or not coming out. It's just a mess. And I I think that for their own sanity, it might be nice just to be like, you know, give us a minute. 
It could be that recalibration that he's hinting at, Wendy, is just that uh, producer John Berg is leaving D.C. Mm -hmm. after the events of Justice League. But do you think that Goyer might be the right play to continue this steam going? That Because Justice League, it costs a lot of money. It made money. Do we continue with that? And would the injection of a Green Lantern core film in this universe actually get us on the right track? I mean, sure, but I, I just feel like they, they need to find a direction and go with it instead of where it's, it's always it's, whether you use the word recalibrate or whatever it is it's it's all the same and it all comes down to we're not really sure we're going to figure it out and we'll just get back to you so instead of keeping keep coming out with these news topics of <coughs> we're gonna there's flash there's green lantern the batman uh, we don't know who's going to be batman now and it's just all this bad you're toying with our hearts like we are such big fans of these comic book movies these properties and you and i like i for example i really enjoy justice league and we got to see a glimpse of the Green Lantern Corps, and that got me really excited. And I said, after this, I would, I would like to see a Green Lantern movie, especially after the, the, the other one that we don't like to talk about. Yeah, yeah. That was so bad, mm -hmm. we could just erase that whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I would just like for them to kind of lay out a plan uh, of, of what is happening next and focus on that. And I think right now is they're trying to appease everybody because everybody wants answers. Who's going to be Batman? Is Wonder Woman going it's to... It's a new Wonder Woman story, blah, blah, blah. And it's just too much. And I think their focus is everywhere. They need to take a breath, refocus, recalibrate on their own and then release something to us that is concrete. Yeah, and Roka, to be mm -hmm. fair to, to everybody involved at DC and Warner Brothers, maybe they're trying to do that, but they keep getting asked questions by people like us. I mean, <laughs> yeah. This wasn't Goyer standing on a soapbox being like, hey guys, Green Lantern movie, wait for it. This is somebody asking him a question and he's like, I, I, I don't know, there's recalibration going on. So yeah. are we just reading too deep into this because we're dying for that Green Lantern movie? Can Green Lantern be the symbol of hope that DC mm -hmm. fans think Think it could be. I think this is an incredibly great answer to a simple question. Are you still doing it still happening? I don't know because they got to recalibrate. It's very <laughs> simple. You know, I drive by the New Beverly now. They've shut down for repairs. I'm not upset. I know it's going to open at some point and they'll have, they'll have movies and I'll be able to watch them again. Same thing with DC. I agree with Joel. They got to shut this thing. And Su and Tuja, uh, Sujahara, is that his name? Is yeah. that how you say his name? Sujahara uh, gave interviews to Variety uh, a couple of days ago and he said, I wanted to do this internal shakeup. Toby Emmerich got promoted. Uh, uh, the lady who was in charge of marketing, she was really powerful. She got moved into a producer slot. The woman who was in charge of uh, the IT marketing, she got moved up into mm -hmm. another slot. So there is recalibration, for lack of a better term, <laughs> happening at, D at DC and Warner Brothers. The thing is, what they I would like them to do is stop announcing projects that are coming down the pike that you don't even know you're going to do. Okay, like, they didn't announce this, though, to be fair. It's like, it's like, hey, Mark, are you working on a new joke about airplane food? Yeah, no, 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 I, no. I can't tell you anything about it. Well, I didn't announce it. Somebody right. asked me. Absolutely, and, and I, you're right, but I'm saying all the stuff before this recalibration, mm. hey, we're going to do a Harley Quinn movie with Joker, and Harley Quinn, we'll do Birds of Prey, and we're going to do this, 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 this. Black Adam, no, 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 just stop. You've got, you've got Shazam announced, great. Aquaman's coming out, great. Uh, you got Wonder Woman 2, 2 coming out, great. Let's all sit down in the boardroom for a couple of months, figure out a plan, look at what Kevin Feige does, get a few steps ahead and figure out a whole plan and then go forward because with all the ill will that they have kind of engendered with us, we still believe in them and want them to do good movies. So it's still Batman, Roca. Yeah, that's yeah right. exactly. <laughs> still yeah, exactly. Up. Exactly. Exactly. Matt Reeves is Batman. They lock down the story. Great. See that gets us excited. Let's take it slow. Yeah, Let's just not lock rush down into the relationship. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, oh, like you need boy. somebody to play the guy. You know, that's. I, I think that's the big question. Yeah, true. Th this is a sports franchise, kids. So you need to just get rid of all the special teams players for right now, and you need to look at your stars. You need to say who's going to be playing quarterback, i.e., Batman. We have Wonder Woman. She's great. Hopefully, Aquaman man is great then mm -hmm. we can start to build something concrete so let's just all take a breath let's stop asking david gore questions yeah. for a couple weeks let's let aquaman come out hopefully it's awesome if it's not then <laughs> this guy is going to be falling but we'll <laughs> wait we'll cross that bridge when it comes to it. i think that aquaman is going to be pretty sweet okay guys i want to remind you all that we're going to save some time for your live twitter questions at the end of this very show you can start tweeting us at collider video and in that vein on monday our studio is closed in observance of martin luther king day but we are going to be doing a special pre-tape episode where we're going to answer a lot of your questions you get to dictate what the show is so go ahead and tweet any questions you have about movies we'll throw some tv in there because somebody on the panel might be a little interested in tv
You guys can ask us behind the scenes questions, whatever you want. Tweet us at Collider Video or go to our Facebook page and ask away. And we'll have a lot of those on the program that's going to air Monday. The top 50 superhero movies of all time. Hell. Number two dropped this morning. I, I wanted to say that all morning. <laughs> Number two drop, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, and uh, yes. the comment section is roused with what <laughs> the answer was. We only got one movie left. That's going to come out tomorrow at 8 a.m. And then we are done. So make sure you guys continue to watch the madness that ensues later on today. We have Jedi Council that is going to be starring Ken Knapsack hosting. And I have no idea who's on the council, but <laughs> might be me wearing a robe. We'll find out. Yeah. In the meantime, we're going to move on to May Mailbag. Mailbag features Karen. Hi, Karen. She writes, Dear Collider Crew, greetings from Denmark. Ooh, well, hello wow. there. Hello. Thanks for a great show and for always brightening my day. With all the Oscar nominations coming soon, so will the inevitable snubs. Rewatching Inside Lumen Davis recently, I was reminded of how disappointed and pissed off I still am. Karen, jeez, that Oscar Isaac <laughs> did not win an Oscar for Best Actor, let alone get nominated. So in that vein, in the last 10 years, is there any performance Ooh. by an actor, actress, director, movie, etc., who did not receive an Oscar nomination that you still think should have gotten one? Have a great day and say hi to Cal from me. Aww. Cal the Wonder Dog accepts your hello, and he responds with a face like Karen. Um, <laughs> I can think of a few off the top of my head. The big one... No, I guess it's still 10 years because it's 2008 is The Dark Knight mm. that everybody got really upset about. And The Dark Knight, arguably, mm -hmm. maybe the reason why the Oscars expanded from 5 to 10 yeah. uh, as far as Best Picture nominations. Inside Lumen Davis is actually a great call because I really mm. enjoyed that movie. I thought The Cat should have been nominated for Best Supporting <laughs> Actor in that film. Joel, is there anything that really comes uh, to the top of your head? You seem you seem like you have an answer. Well, similar as with Greta Gerwig at the Golden Globes, how can your movie be nominated for Best Picture, your actors nominated for Best Actors, and you not nominated for Best Director? We saw that happen with Ava DuVernay and Selma. Mm -hmm. Just she, you know, and some, there's this thing with the Oscars and the Oscar Committee, there's a lot of pomp and circus circumstances kind of expected for you to get the nomination you know you're expected to put out the advertisements and go to the parties and shake the right hands so that then they can like you know grant you the nomination that you're seeking um but i i felt that ava had her work stood for itself i didn't you know she didn't want to do the party she was busy working on her next project already as ava always is um and to overlook her when she, best song uh best picture uh and i think two best actor um noms or best actor and best supporting it, it was ridiculous Ava should have been nominated for Best Director. Um, and, and I'll point this out, too, because we're talking about the Oscars. Michelle Williams, going back to our uh, previous conversation, oh, yeah. been nominated four times. Four times she's been nominated. She, she hasn't won an Oscar yet, but she's been nominated four times. Ugh. Brokeback Mountain, Blue Valentine, My Week with Marilyn, Ugh. and Manchester by the Sea. You see that one scene in Manchester Ugh. by the Sea. She's not in it that much, but... That holy crap! That is a that is a powerful scene. I feel you could say that about every Michelle who like I, I remember the one in Blue Valentine, Blue Valentine. the oh fight in the God. hotel, um, or uh, my week with Marilyn when she has her spiral right before yeah. she's supposed oh, to go yeah. on set. Yeah. Like there's always that one moment where you're like, no. I'm happy that I saw Blue Valentine when I did because now every time <laughs> I'm mad at somebody or I'm in an argument in my head, I'm thinking, wait, am I Ryan Gosling at Michelle Williams' <laughs> work right now? Okay, I better back off here. I don't want to be that guy. Um, speaking of that guy, Roca. Uh, <laughs> any Oscar snubs that you can uh, that you can think of off the top of your head in the last ten years? You know, you just messed my mind up because. I had an ex-girlfriend who used to say to me, you need to watch Blue Valentine. What does that mean? What does that mean? I wonder. Anyway, no. Um, it's not good. <laughs> let me tell you, it's not good. No, I think she just liked the film because she knows I love films. Okay. Right, yeah, oh, that's what tell I tell myself. You want, that's what I tell myself in the fetal position at night. No, listen, the big snubs. Um, I thought Jake Gyllenhaal being snubbed for Nightcrawler was huge mm. for me because he was fantastic in that movie. He wasn't nominated and it drove me insane because Jake brings the thunder with every time he acts and he brings so much passion and power. And I thought for one, he did something that was incredibly restrained and unsettling as hell the whole time throughout the movie. And that's a hell of a tightrope to walk. I also thought Amy Adams not being nominated for Arrival drove me insane. I love that movie. Loved her in that movie. There's no reason Florence Foster Jenkins, Meryl Streep, no... No disrespect, young lady, uh, madam, you are the greatest, <laughs> but you do not. You did not deserve it for Florence Foster Jenkins. Amy Adams, without her, that movie doesn't work. Without that movie, that wasn't happen. She's so perfect in conveying that role. And so, to me, those are two of the biggest snubs acting-wise for me. See, I think Florence Foster Jenkins should have communicated with the aliens in Arrival. That movie would have been done in 20 minutes. <laughs> wow. wow. Um, Wendy, what do you think is the biggest snub of the last 10 years? Well, John Roca needs to get out of my head because you took both of mine. <laughs> what? Now I have to think of a new answer I'm sorry. Uh, on the live show. And I'm going to say it's not really a snub, but it's just kind of a disappointment that Gary Oldman, who is one of my, my mm. all-time favorite mm -hmm. actor, has never received 
an Oscar. I, I'm hoping Yet. that we would we would probably most likely if I could put money on it, I would that he's going to win for Darkest Hour this year. But I, I am so surprised at the career that he's had and at the caliber that he is at. He's not won a single Academy Award. Yeah, I, I think that could change with Darkest Hour because the Oscars love from time to time giving somebody, if it's a tie-break situation, but do we love this actor, we love this actor, who's going to get the award, who's had the best career to this point? And sometimes I like that it works out that way. I love that Jeff Bridges won for Crazy Heart. Yeah. That it was mm -hmm. a great performance in Crazy Heart. There were a lot of other good actors that year, and Jeff Bridges had an incredible career, hadn't won yet, so I think that's fair. Sing Street is also a movie that should have been nominated for Best Picture. Yes. Uh, yes. You, you had another slot yes. available. You could have thrown it in there. Why? Why not do it? Okay, kids, it's time for some live Twitter questions. So we're going to go ahead and cue that up right now. Roca, I need you to say something for about 10 seconds. Sicario so is another snub. Something. 2015, Sicario oh, should have been nominated no, for Best man. Picture. Yes. It is the Best Picture 2015. I don't care what you say. That film should have been nominated and should have won. Denny Villeneuve, that film is incredible. And to see where he jumped Who to do next. Who did win that year? Huh? Who did win that year? Do you remember? Um, uh, Google. Was it, was Google zero? is my friend. I don't know. 2015. Two years ago. Schmodown. I'm old, clearly. <laughs> Schmodown. All right, let's go on to uh, live Twitter questions. If it was Argo, I'm going to flip tables. <laughs> I'll be honest, I really wasn't paying attention to the conversation that just happened. I heard Argo Roka get loud about something, and I was Spotlight. like, I'll just look Spotlight for a Twitter question. Spotlight that's right. Spotlight, Spotlight, Spotlight one. Spotlight is so excellently well written. Yeah, that's really that's also hard. a really good but movie. But Cesario, I, ooh, that, now, I feel like now we're just dealing with preferences. All right. Spotlight's pretty good, though. Yeah, it's pretty good. Spotlight's really good. Okay. Oh, uh, newspaper movie. At nice. Subatomic Freak <laughs> asks, if you're stranded on a desert <laughs> island, what DVDs would you take with you? We're assuming Ooh. the desert island has a Blu-ray slash DVD player. Otherwise, the question is rendered mute. Um, Wendy. I mean, could I just get Netflix? Uh, I am wow. not allowing Netflix. Wow. Don't you cop out. Because the same thing's going to happen whether you're stranded on a desert <laughs> island or you're at home. You're going to turn on Netflix. You're just going to keep... Yep. No, no, no. That's, that's true. That's what happens to everybody on Netflix, so I'm giving you three DVDs. Ooh. Three DVDs? Yeah. Three. Okay. Okay, woof. The Fifth Element. Okay. Mm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Little Mermaid, because I have to have animation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, I am going to take, let's take a horror movie. Let's, let's take Nightmare on Elm Street. Classic. I don't know if I want that on a desert island, though. I think I would freak myself yeah. out to death and like hide. Maybe we, okay, but I'm going to stick with those uh, I don't know that you want the little mermaid on a desert island. You're going to get enough of water stuff just <laughs> being on the desert I island. I need something I can relate to to, to to make me think of the better part of to being evolve surrounded into a by mermaid. water. Okay, uh, questionable picks <laughs> from Wendy Lee. You're just jealous of my picks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Joelle, Wendy took the fifth element uh, and the little mermaid. You cannot have them. What are your three DVDs you're taking to the desert island? Amadeus, because okay. it's long and it will preoccupy occupy me but it's always fascinating nice. Great choice. um yes. i'm gonna take waitress because it's sweet but it also makes me cry but it's also well written and good lord it's just fun um and pies you know you good, good pie recipes while you're on the desert <laughs> island um and then i also need an animated oh gosh spirited away or howl's moving castle such hard choices i'm gonna go howl's moving castle because spirited away would freak me out because she's alone in the island, and I can't, yeah. Oh, no. So, yeah, Howl's Moving Castle, totally. Oh, no, no, I changed my Kiki's Delivery Service, because I'm going to keep spirits light and up, so, yeah. Man, you really thought this out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Roka, how many Van Damme movies you taking? <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Listen, nowadays, they put them all on one Blu-ray, all four movies, so I'll take one if I cop out. No, no. Nice. <laughs> no, I, I would take uh, Hoosiers, because I just love inspirational stuff. It'll keep my spirits up. When Harry met Sally, because I'd laugh, and just in case a female gets crashed on the island with me, in the future, I know how to talk to her and do it, and have a romantic comedy myself on the island. And the third one is probably uh, Lawrence of Arabia. I would say mm -hmm. Godfather Part Two, but it's so dark. I'd rather do Lawrence of Arabia with the possibility and the four hour, like you said, take some time. Okay, you guys are not thinking about this practically. The first movie I'm taking what? is Castaway. I need to learn how to start a fire on the island. You can watch, Fair. you can slow mo, Fair. you can see it. Tom Hanks, the FedEx guy can figure it out. I'm gonna be able to figure That's it out. It's gonna get meta day four. Like day four, you'd be like, am I Tom Hanks or am I Wilson? Like what's happening to me? He's gonna be looking for a ledge. Like, where is it? Where is it? Where's that rock I can extract my tooth with? Where's my ship raining down packages? The second DVD I'm gonna 
take is uh, JFK because oh. I feel Whoa. like as I start to get crazier, it's going to totally <laughs> sync up with what's going on in the movie. And I'm just going to have this great, like, I'm going to have so many great conspiracy theories once I get off that <laughs> island. And the third DVD is, you guessed it, Roca, highlights of Super Bowl 22. Oh. I'm not leaving yes. the Doug Williams led Washington Redskins victory in the 1987 season, played January 31st, 1988. Oh, One more God. Twitter question. We will call it a day. The Real American Hero says, Do you think the Super Bowl, speaking of, will hinder the Black Panther first week sales. The Super Bowl is the Sunday of the weekend that Black Panther is released. Unfortunately, mm. I don't think that's true. I do not think that Black Panther actually comes out. Valentine's it comes out on the 16th. It comes out on the 16th, and the Super Bowl will have already been played. Cool. So that question, uh, because Black Panther comes out a week after the Super Bowl, Super Bowl is the first weekend in February, because the Super Bowl, yeah, not even the Super the Bowl, fourth. not even the Super Bowl would dare compete with <laughs> Valentine's Day. Yeah. That is a situation <laughs> nobody wants. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't want that. <laughs> we'll talk about no. Blue Valentine. Is there another uh, question we have? Another Twitter question? We can't answer that one because the Super Bowl's not coming out. On the same uh, yeah, sure. I'll give you one more Twitter okay. question. Sure. I got nothing else to do. <laughs> February fourth. <4th. laughs> February fourth is the Super Bowl. So yeah, yeah. There's no way. Okay. Back. If it was the same weekend, I do not think it would have affected no. things. <laughs> no. uh, Sean Jordan has our last question here. Right. Who is your favorite child actor right now? He thinks Ooh. that Jaden Lieberher is incredibly. Talented, uh, yeah, it's a pretty good call. I'm gonna go with uh, that Trent Blake kid. I think that he's <laughs> he's just so amazing. He was he was great in Room, but then also in the Book of Henry, which I know is like a, kind of a, some people loved it, some people hated it. I thought it was a great movie, I, he, and he's so good and he's so powerful, and he just can't. I I I hate kids that are able to convey that much emotion at such a young age. How dare I still you? Can't do it. Yeah, you know? totally. Uh, I like uh, Ali Cravajo, who was uh, the voice of Moana. Oh, yeah. uh, oh, she's yeah. gonna be in Rise. She is. So sweet and humble, but also just way excited about the industry, which, you know, after you've been around for a while, you're just like, oh, it's just all tedious. She's like, I can just sing. And you're like, oh, yes, little girl, like, be excited and happy. Um, and then, oh, I'm blinking so hard on her name, but the little girl from Blackish, who just, like, booked oh, a movie yeah. deal. Um, but she sh gives looks like no one else. Uh, she seems in the same vein of, like, uh, Mara Wilson and uh, some other, like, child actors who just randomly, like, way ahead in her uh, thinking for her age, uh, so I, I expect big things from her. Yeah, how are these kids so well adjusted? I, I don't get it. Uh, Mara says her parents, so, you know, have yeah. good parents who aren't relying on your uh, career for their house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. I guess that's probably that probably helps when, when a <laughs> ten-year-old doesn't have to pay the rent. I mean, obviously, Millie Bobby Brown doing incredible things, and she's producing and starring in the new Sherlock Holmes spinoff uh, about Sherlock Holmes' much younger sister. Wendy, do you have any uh, child actors? I do, and she's, uh, to me, she's a newcomer. Uh, when I saw the Flor Florida Project, I fell in love oh. with her. Brooklyn Prince yeah. mm, is... Good one. Uh, so she, that movie made me cry so hard. Like, I went from, like, what the heck am I watching? I don't like how this is making me feel to just being in, in tears. And I was like, oh, this is so real. And she, <laughs> she has, for being as young as she was, and being able to convey all these emotions from beginning to end, you see that transition you know, of, of their time living in that hotel is amazing. And I don't know what she's doing next, but I'm looking forward to more from her. Uh, John Roca, who you got? There's only one answer, Daphne Keene. She was fantastic in X, as X-23 in Logan. Mm. That is an incredible part to walk into, to hold your own with Hugh Jackman, and at times steal scenes from Hugh Jackman and Patrick Stewart. Mm -hmm. That says something about your talent, your ability, and your composure as a young person. So to me, I look forward to see what she can do, and I loved her in the movie, and I, I'm just looking forward to it. And I thought she was going to be great. She'll be a powerhouse. Dude, All right. She'll be acting for a long time. Shout out to Finn Wolfhard, who occasionally watches this program. Oh, yeah. and all those oh, things Wolfhard! Kids, they are really, is great. really talented. And also sweet. throw Broom Kid in there. You were great. <laughs> Broom Kid is my favorite child actor as of right now. Thanks for the memories. And thank you guys for a great episode of Collider Holy. Movie Talk. Thank you to everybody behind the scenes helping us out today, as well Woo. as my panel up here with me. Joelle, thank you so much for joining us. Thank Please you come me. back soon. Where can the kids find you? Hey guys, I'm Joelle Monique. You can find me all over the internet at Joelle Monique every week at Black Girl Nerds. Uh, Mondays, 5 o'clock. Uh, on After Buzz, I do Animation Weekly with the great Carrie D. Lane. Uh, and, oh, now I'm doing The Magicians. If you're into TV, if you're into magic and oh. grad school, it's The Magicians. <laughs> uh, we recap that 10 o'clock on After Buzz on YouTube.
How do you have time to watch all that TV and still get eight hours of the Weather Channel in every day? <laughs> she is indeed a magician, everybody. Thank you, Joel. Wendy Lee, where can the kids find you? You can find me on YouTube at the Movie Couple channel uh, and on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat at Wendy Lee Zaney. Tell Dustin and the doggies I said hi. Uh, and John house. Roca, how about you and me watch Blue Valentine this weekend and just have a cry? Let's do it. And then yell at each other the whole time. I love it. Yeah, you guys can find me at the Roca Says on Twitter and Instagram. Don't forget, tomorrow on The Cinephiles, we start uh, our two part breakdown of Citizen Kane, one we've been waiting a year and a half to do, and so I think you guys are going to enjoy it. Please subscribe on iTunes and on Stitcher. I am merely Mark Ellis. You can follow me on Twitter at Mark Ellis Live. Uh, January 26th and the 27th, I'll be doing stand-up at the Ice House Comedy Club right here in Pasadena. Until then, we'll see you guys tomorrow for a new episode of Clotter Movie Talk. Might as well jump. Hey everybody, Mark Ellis here. Thanks for watching this episode of Collider Movie Talk. You wanna watch more? Then click up here or you can click right here for more great content from Collider. And if you haven't subscribed to Collider Video, do so right now and share this vid with your friends. Thanks for watching.